and now we are going to be talking about the glycogen storage disorder in glycogen storage disorder two things can happen either there is deposits of lot of glycogen so abnormal deposits or there will be synthesis of the abnormal glycogen okay so either the normal glycogen getting deposited in large amounts or the synthesis of abnormal glycogen is occurring both of them will result in the glycogen storage disorder okay now uh, glycogen storage disorder is very very important why because every time in every paper we are going to get at least one clinical case from the glycogen storage disorder so we have to see how to identify that we are dealing with glycogen storage disorder and then how to distinguish between the different types of of the glycogen storage disorder this is the challenge when we are talking about the topic of the glycogen storage disorder okay so like i said either you have the abnormal type or you have the abnormal quantity of the glycogen second thing is the deposits can occur either in the muscle or in the liver rarely at other places also the deposits can occur so let's look at the glycogen storage disorder so first challenge in the glycogen storage disorder will be to identify that we are dealing with the glycogen storage disorder how do you know that we are dealing with the glycogen storage disorder so if you have the following features you can categorically say that okay we are most likely dealing with the glycogen storage disorder first in this list will be the finding of hypoglycemia the hypoglycemia may be profound that is very severe or it may be uh, on the you can say the moderate side or the lighter side but hypoglycemia will be one feature second feature is the evidence of the chronic hypoglycemia will have the biochemical findings which tell us that okay this hypoglycemia has been there for quite some time we call it the chronic hypoglycemia we find the evidence of a chronic hypoglycemia what are these features this includes first of all when the hypoglycemia will be there then the lipogenesis will occur and you will find the increased free fatty acid this free fatty acid will go to the liver and can result in the formation of the ketone bodies the fatty acids will get conjugated and released in the form of the vldl the vldl will finally get converted into the ldl and therefore we also find the increased cholesterol so if any of these findings is there it indicates the chronic hypoglycemia and lastly at least one organomegaly so when you find one of these three rather these three features then you can have in your mind that okay we are dealing with the glycogen storage disorder okay so hypoglycemia evidence of chronic hypoglycemia and the at least one organomegaly this will tell you about the glycogen storage disorder so now we can start looking at the different glycogen storage disorders please note the glycogen storage disorder just like the mucopolysaccharidosis previously used to have names but nowadays we describe them using numbers and we use the term gsd for glycogen storage disorder for going into the details please note there can also be the gsd 0 0 means the glycogen metabolism is defective but storage is not occurring in this case what we have is the deficiency of the glycogen synthase so that the glycogen will not at all be synthesized okay so this will be different from the other glycogen storage disorders this is glycogen storage disorder 0 meaning the glycogen is not getting synthesized at all we don't have the older name for this this is a newer discovery so we we'll don't have the traditional name for gsd 0 let's go on to the gsd type 1 better known as the gsd type 1a okay traditionally this is described as the von gerke's disease traditionally described as the von gerke's disease and in the von gerke's disease the deficient enzyme all of you know is the glucose 6 phosphatase the deficient enzyme 
is the glucose 6 phosphatase. So, how are we going to identify the glycogen storage disorder type 1a or the von Gerke's disease? What are the characteristic findings? The two most characteristic findings are number one, the hypoglycemia is very severe, severe hypoglycemia. Why the hypoglycemia is severe? Take a look at the enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase. This enzyme is required in the glycogen breakdown in the liver in the last step we had said to release the glucose 6 phosphate to glucose we require the glucose 6 phosphatase. This enzyme I had highlighted is also required in the gluconeogenesis. In gluconeogenesis, the last enzyme is again the glucose 6 phosphatase. And what is the function of the glycogenolysis and the gluconeogenesis? Both of them help to support the blood glucose level. Now, when the glucose 6 phosphatase is not there, both the systems are getting disrupted. Right. So, the blood glucose level will fall drastically when you move from the fed state to the fasting state because neither glycogenolysis nor gluconeogenesis is providing the blood glucose. So, there is a drastic fall in the blood glucose which will cause the severe hypoglycemia. In case of the severe hypoglycemia, if you do the exercise or you can say physical activity, it will result in the fainting of the individual. So, very commonly the patients are brought from the playing field with an episode of fainting. Okay. So, the fainting episode is one of the another characteristic finding in these patients. When you do the biochemical examination, you find the severe hypoglycemia is there. Talking about organomegaly, glucose 6 phosphatase I told you is present only in two tissues, the liver and in the kidney. So, these are the two organs which are going to be enlarged. Liver and kidney will get enlarged. Later on, we will see in molecular biology section that uh, when the glucose 6 phosphatase is not there, glucose 6 phosphate will be upregulated. We have seen previously that glucose 6 phosphate is a substrate for HMP shunt. When a lot of glucose 6 phosphate is there, glycolysis will get saturated and HMP shunt will also be upregulated, particularly in the liver. Result lots and lots of purine will be formed, but purine we will discuss later cannot be stored. And when a lot of purine is there, what we will find is the hyperuricemia. So, another very important finding in these patients will be hyperuricemia. So, these are some of the characteristic findings for the von Gerke disease, severe hypoglycemia with fainting episode, enlargement of the liver and the kidney and the hyperuricemia will be additional finding for the von Gerke disease. Hyperuricemia you know can present as gout, the renal stone or the tophite depending on whether the treatment has been taken or not. Moving on to the second type of the glycogen storage disorder, the GST type 2. The GST type 2 is known as the Pompe's disease. The GST type 2 is known as the Pompe's disease and in Pompe's disease, the enzyme which is deficient is known as the acid maltase and this enzyme is present inside the lysosome. Please understand that some amount of glycogen synthesis and breakdown occurs in all the tissues, right? Storage occurs only in 2-3 tissues which I have mentioned liver, muscle and the brain, but some amount of glycogen synthesis and breakdown occurs in all the tissues. This glycogen uh, is broken down and it is taken inside the lysosome where the degradation products which are known as the maltose. We have discussed maltose is coming from either glycogen or the starch breakdown. So, the maltose is then broken down in the lysosome by the acid maltase to provide the glucose for the energy. Now, the acid maltase is not deficient, not present in the lysosome in all the tissues in this case, alright. So, whatever limited amount of glycogen metabolism was occurring in all the tissues will get affected, not only in the liver or in the muscle, but in all the tissues it will get affected. However, uh, because it is not affecting the glucose 6 phosphatase, etc., the hypoglycemia may not be severe. We can have mild to moderate hypoglycemia. So, one point which you will note here is the multi organ involvement. Multi organ involvement is there. Muscle weakness, uh, muscle weakness uh, can be there. Uh, in fact, there are two variants of pompes. One is seen in the children and the other is seen in the adults. Uh, so, in the children, the hypotonia can be there and uh, the caregiver can complain that, okay, the child is not eating uh, properly. Those complaints can be there. But the biggest problem 
the biggest problem is among the different organs which get involved is the heart resulting in cardiomegaly and this cardiomegaly will be the cause for early death. Except for enzyme replacement therapy, we do not have any significant treatment options. So, if the enzyme replacement therapy is not provided, there will be the early death either in that same clinical case will be described the patient expired by the age of two and a half or three years or there can be history of a sibling having similar disease who expired at early age. So, early death will very commonly be described in the question either for the same patient or for a sibling who has the similar condition. Okay. So, remember the early death is a very important feature of pompase which is commonly due to the cardiomegaly this results in the heart failure. Okay. And then we move on to the GSD3. GSD3 is one of the uh, more commonly presenting uh, conditions with a lot of important uh, clinical features we will look at that. The GSD3 is known as the Cori's disease. GST 3 is known as the Cori's disease. Here the deficient enzyme is the D branching enzyme. The deficient enzyme is the D branching enzyme which is defective in both liver and in the muscle. How to remember? Third disease, third letter Cori's and C is followed by D. So, to remember the enzyme C followed by D in Cori is the D branching enzyme is defective. C followed by D, the D branching enzyme is defective in the Cori's. So, what will happen when the D branching enzyme is not working? See, the glycogen breakdown will get blocked at the branch site because at the branch site we have to resolve the uh, glucose which is attached by alpha 1 6 linkage which is done by the D branching enzyme. So, the branches will not get resolved. In the fasting state, the glycogen will get stuck at the branch site when you feed more and more branches will start appearing. Okay. So, it will appear like when you take the biopsy and you examine it under the microscope, you will find that tissue is filled with the glycogen giving the appearance of what is known as limit dextrin. So, we find lot of limit dextrin on the microscopic examination and therefore, the condition is sometimes also known as the limit dextrinosis. Okay. So, what is happening here? We get the abnormal glycogen. So, if in the question it says the deposits of normal glycogen is there, then the quarries is out. So, we get the abnormal glycogen. Okay. Abnormal glycogen. Second point which you have to remember here, because only the branch site is getting blocked, the chain is getting cleaved normally. Long chain is there, the glycogen phosphorylase will break it normally. So, in, uh, in the immediate post fed state, the glucose level will be normal, but hypoglycemia will occur when in the fasting state. So, severe fasting hypoglycemia means overnight the fasting is there and when you measure in the morning then the hypoglycemia will be there. So, severe fasting hypoglycemia is there. Normally what happens when the hypoglycemia is there you give the glucagon, glucagon will try to mobilize more of the glucose from whatever glycogen is left over. But here the glucagon uh, cannot have any effect why because the problem is at the branch site at branch site the debranching enzyme is there which is not affected by glucagon, glucagon will act on the glycogen phosphorylase. So, another important finding which you have to remember here is glucagon administration in fasting does not increase the blood glucose level. However, if you give the glucagon during the fed state, the blood glucose level will rise is showing that the glycogen phosphorylase is working normally. But in this case, the problem is not in the glycogen phosphorylase, the problem is in the D branching enzyme. So, the glucagon administration in the fasting state will not help the blood glucose level. The enzyme is deficient in both liver and in the muscle. So, both liver and muscle enlargement is going to occur. Okay. 
So what are the important points you have to note here? First, which is the deficient enzyme? How to remember? C followed by D. Second, it is also known as the limit dextrinosis. Third, the type of glycogen which is getting stored is abnormal. Fourth, in the clinical case, very frequently it is mentioned the severe fasting hypoglycemia. Sometimes it is also described when you give the glucagon in the fasting state, the blood glucose level does not rise. And in the clinical case, sometimes the organomegaly will be there. So, you have to remember that liver and muscle both are getting enlarged in the Cori's disease glycogen storage disorder type 3. Moving on to glycogen storage disorder type 4. This is commonly known as the Anderson's disease. Okay, this is commonly known as Anderson's disease. And to remember the enzyme, we say use the same trick C followed by D, A followed by B because the deficient enzyme is the branching enzyme. So, same trick we are using A is followed by B, C followed by D, and A followed by B that is the branching enzyme. So, now when the branching enzyme is not there, what will happen? the uh, chain becomes long when the time comes for branching the enzyme is not there. So, chain will keep becoming longer and longer and longer and spontaneous branching we have discussed is occurring at 24 to 26 residues. So, what you find is poorly branched glycogen. We find the poorly branched glycogen. Here we had the highly branched glycogen. Right, and now we have the poorly branched glycogen. This poorly branched glycogen will resemble the amylopectin of starch. We had said amylopectin of starch is poorly branched, so it resembles the amylopectin, and therefore the condition is sometimes also known as amylopectinosis. All right, the condition will be called the amylopectinosis. So remember here also what we are getting, we are getting the abnormal glycogen. We are getting the abnormal glycogen. And the last point that you have to remember, the enzyme is deficient in both liver and muscle. So, liver and muscle enlargement both will occur. Okay. In this case, the muscle weakness is generally not there, exercise intolerance is generally not there, although hypoglycemia will be there, it is not very profound Okay, because some amount of glycogen breakdown is occurring gradually, although it is slow, but it is occurring. Okay. Then we go to the next disorder, very, very frequently asked in your exam, that is the GSD5, GSD type 5 also known as the McArdle's disease. GSD5 also known as the McArdle's disease. Here the deficient enzyme is the phosphorylase in the muscle. The glycogen phosphorylase in the muscle only is defective. So, we call it the myophosphorylase. How to remember? For M, the deficient enzyme is M. M for M, myophosphorylase in the McArdle's is deficient. Now, to understand the feature of the McArdle, we have to very briefly see how the energy is being provided in the muscle. Once we see that, then it will be easier to describe what is happening in the glycogen storage disorder type 5, also known as the McArdle disease. Before that, remember, because only the phosphorylase in the muscle is deficient, only muscle enlargement will occur. Only the muscle enlargement is going to occur. Let us quickly see how the energy is being provided in the muscle during the contraction. Okay. So, I will draw a very simple table showing the relevant points of how the energy is getting provided. And here we talk about the time frame on the top and on the lower side we talk about the source of energy for the muscle contraction source of energy for the muscle contraction right let's see so, when we talk about the uh, muscle contraction, we can talk about the immediate time frame that is 
3 to 5 seconds. Immediately when you start the exercise, the 3 to 5 seconds. In these 3 to 5 seconds, the energy will be provided by the stored ATP, some amount of ATP is stored in the muscle in the resting stage, which can provide the energy for the initial 3 to 5 seconds for the contraction. Once the stored ATP is exhausted for the next 20 to 30 seconds, the energy will be provided by the stored phosphocreatine. The stored phosphocreatine is actually going to regenerate the ATP. The stored phosphocreatine will regenerate the ATP and thereby it will provide the energy. Because of this reason, the stored phosphocreatine is also known as the phosphagen. Okay, it is known as the phosphagen. So, after the stored ATP is exhausted, the stored phosphocreatine will help to regenerate the ATP. But once both ATP and the phosphocreatine have been exhausted, in that case, what happens is the glyc. Uh, we have the phase of the tissue where vasodilatation has not yet occurred, but the stores have been exhausted. So, we talk about the phase before vasodilatation and then we will have the phase which is after vasodilatation. Typically the phase which is before the vasodilatation can last from 2 to 5 minutes depending on the training of the individual, well trained individuals the vasodilatation will occur faster otherwise it can occur later. In the phase of before vasodilatation, the glycogen breakdown is going to provide the energy but please remember during this glycogen breakdown, the glucose which is coming will be metabolized by anaerobic glycolysis. Why? Because we have the limited blood supply, the oxygen which is available is being used for the basal metabolism. Extra oxygen has not yet come. So, the extra glucose which is being made available will be metabolized by the anaerobic glycolysis. And once the vasodilatation has occurred, extra blood is coming with that blood, two things will come, the glucose as well as the oxygen. So, at that time, the energy will come from the blood glucose and this blood glucose will be metabolized via the aerobic glycolysis and not the anaerobic glycolysis it will be metabolized via the aerobic glycolysis. Okay. So, these are the different phases in muscle contraction and how the energy is being provided in the different phases. Now, think of an individual who has the myocardial disease. Suppose I have the myocardial disease and uh, I decide okay, this year I am going to run in the marathon. I will complete the Delhi marathon or the Hyderabad marathon or the Bangalore marathon when it is there. So, for that I need to start practicing. So, I tell my friends, okay, some of my friends are doing the marathon every year. So, I tell them this year I will also do the marathon. So, they tell me, okay, come with us in the morning and we will go for the practice. So, when I go with them for the practice, when I start running the phase 1, I have some amount of the stored ATP. So, I can run for 3 to 5 seconds, right. Once the stored ATP is exhausted, I want to run more, then the stored phosphocreatine will come into play. I can run for 20 to 30 seconds more. But now when I reach the phase 3, when the stored ATP, stored phosphocreatine both are exhausted and when I want to run more, vasodilatation has not yet occurred. Energy has to come from glycogenolysis, but the myophosphorylase is not there. So, glycogenolysis will not occur. If glycogenolysis will not occur, the glucose for the glycolysis will not be there. Energy supplied to the muscle will be cut off. So, suddenly I will start developing the muscle cramp. The, my body will not support me, I will immediately sit down and I will start uh, uh, doing the exercise, the cooling down for the muscle because now the muscle are not getting the energy, they have got locked in the contracted state. Okay. This is known as the exercise intolerance. So, immediately my friends come around and uh, they start telling me oh, what has happened. So, I tell them my, uh, no, I cannot run anymore. My body tells me that okay, this is the maximum you can run. You don't, you cannot run my beyond this. So, my friends will start laughing. Obviously, the, that day one is there after 30 seconds I have sit down, I say I cannot run more. So, they will say oh, the only two things can happen. Either you complete the marathon in 30 seconds 
only then you can complete it or you forget about the marathon so but i have decided that i am going to run the marathon so i sit for 2 3 minutes and then i get up and start and i want to start running again but what has happened now in this 2 3 minutes that i was sitting now the vasodilatation has occurred when i start doing the exercise the uh, neural stimulus for vasodilatation has already gone and even if i stop after 30 40 seconds that neural impulse is not withdrawn so after some time the vasodilatation will occur and the blood glucose will increase blood glucose uh, will increase because the blood supply has increased and we can have the aerobic glycosis which will provide the energy so after 2 3 minutes when i try to run i can run again this is known as the second wind phenomena so what do we see we see the exercise intolerance followed by the second wind phenomena this is the characteristic finding in the mccardles in mccardles the characteristic finding is exercise intolerance followed by the second wind phenomena so that is what i'll write here the characteristic finding is exercise intolerance which is followed by the second wind phenomena okay so this is another of the common uh, conditions which comes to the clinic the type 3 and type 5 in addition to the type 1 the von Gerke case moving on to the type 6 Type 6 is a very mild type of the GSD. Sometimes it may not even come to the uh, clinics. The uh, type 6 is described as the HERS disease. Previously, it has been described as the HERS disease. And here, the deficient enzyme is only the hepatic phosphorylase. The phosphorylase only in the liver is deficient. Remember the gluconeogenesis in this case will be normal. So the hypoglycemia will not also be severe. It will be mild to moderate uh, hypoglycemia can be in there. And because only the liver enzyme is deficient, only the liver enlargement will occur. Okay, only the liver enlargement will occur. Now we also have the condition known as the GSD type 7. GSD type 7 previously known as the Therouille's disease however here actual problem is not in the enzymes of the glycogen metabolism what is deficient is the phosphofructokinase type 1 in the muscle and in the RBC. So what happens if the PFK1 is not working, glycolysis will not work properly, so the glycogen breakdown will be blocked. When a lot of glucose and glucose 6 phosphate will accumulate in the muscle, the breakdown will stop. Because of that, the glycogen storage can occur. So uh, what will happen? What will the presentation in this condition? Point number one, th there will be the muscle enlargement because it is affecting only the muscle and RBC okay point number two let's go back to the muscle and see what is the possible presentation in this case so what will happen in this patient when he starts running in the first phase he will be running normally he will be able to run normally in the second phase but he cannot run in the third phase why because the problem is there in the muscle okay so uh, because the problem is there in the muscle the in the glycolysis so even if the glycogen breakdown occurs the glycolysis will not work properly and energy will not be provided so he will have the exercise intolerance when we go to phase 4 when you go to phase 4 blood glucose is increased but the problem is not in the supply of the fuel the problem is in the glycolysis so what will happen here there will be no second wind phenomena Exercise intolerance without second wind phenomena will be seen in the GSD type 7. So remember here we have the exercise intolerance without the second wind phenomena. So this is how you are going to distinguish 
between the GSD type 5 and the GSD type 7. Both will present with the muscle enlargement, both will present with exercise intolerance. But in GSD 5, we have the second wind phenomena. In GSD 7, we do not have the second wind phenomena. Okay. So, this is how we are going to distinguish between the different types of the glycogen storage disorders. First, you have to identify that you are dealing with the glycogen storage disorder. How do we do that? We look at the features which is described in the question hypoglycemia, evidence of chronic hypoglycemia in form of the biochemical findings and at least one organomegaly should be described. Once these are there in the question, we are dealing with the glycogen storage disorder and now we have to distinguish between the different glycogen storage disorders. So, these are the various features that I have told you for each of them, some characteristic findings for each. For example, the fainting episode for the GST type 1, hyperuricemia, liver and kidney enlargement in the type 1. In type 2, we said early death and the cardiomegaly. Okay, cardiomegaly is a very characteristic finding which helps to identify the GSD type 2. In GSD type 3, what we have? We have the severe fasting hypoglycemia. Okay, and this hypoglycemia does not respond to glucose administration very characteristic feature for the type 3. In type 4, we have the poorly branched glycogen. In type 5, we have the exercise intolerance which is associated with the second wind phenomena and in type 7, we have the exercise intolerance without the second wind phenomena. So, these are some of the highlights with the help of which you can distinguish between the different glycogen storage disorders. Every time we are going to get clinical case from glycogen storage disorder. So, this video is very, very, very important. How to distinguish between the different glycogen storage disorder, how to identify that we are dealing with a glycogen storage disorder. In every exam, we are going to get at least one clinical case from the glycogen storage disorder. Rarely, they can be single line questions, but almost always they are going to come as the clinical case. After clinical case, they can ask you either to identify the condition, they can ask you about the enzyme deficiency, they can ask you a follow-up question based on the associated features that we have discussed. Please note, for the GST type 2, that is for the pompase disease, the enzyme replacement therapy has been made available. Why? Because just uh, dietary management is not enough in these patients. In the infantile age group, they will die. So, enzyme replacement therapy can be helpful in protecting uh, the child from the death. But uh, in other cases, uh, only the dietary management is more than enough to manage the signs and symptoms of the patient. In pompase, because early death occurs in the infantile form, it is important to institute the enzyme replacement therapy in these patients. Others can simply be managed by the dietary management. So, that is all about the glycogen storage disorder. Please ensure you revise this very, very, very important topic for the exam. Always going to land up in your exam. Thank you.